Good morning, everyone. If you weren't at um, WICSAP orientation on Thursday, my name is Michelle Dixon Wall. I work here at the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs. I've been here uh, with the agency for the last uh, nine years and um, super excited to be here with you all uh, on this um, Advocate Core uh, course journey. And I'm joined with my co-facilitator, Patricia. Do you want to introduce yourself and just, you know, kick us off today, Patricia? Sure. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Patricia. I'm the advocacy coordinator here at WICSAP. And most recently, my most recent um, tenure here has been, it'll be three years in June, but I've worked with WICSAP in the past and uh, been involved with WICSAP since 2008 off and on. I'm really happy to be here with all of you. The first thing we do um, in our advocate core training, Michelle mentioned it in orientation, is we do a land acknowledgement. And it's really important because in this land acknowledgement, there are not just empty words. We feel this, and I'm speaking for us here at WICSAP, in our hearts, in our minds, and it's giving power back to the people who've been here since time immemorial, taking care of the sacred territory. So the WICSAP office is physically in Olympia on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, more specifically the Nisqually and Squaxin Island people. Olympia and South Puget Sound region are covered by the Treaty of Medicine Creek signed under duress in 1864. And you know, I wanted to add something to that first line on the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, really important. Thank you, Michelle, for putting the longer um, bit of information in the chat regarding the history, a little bit of history um, of this area. I live in Tacoma, so I reside in um, the land of the Puyallup. Would anybody else like to add anything or share in the chat or even unmute themselves if they will have something to share about this. You will be invited to um, do a land acknowledgement. If you feel moved to do that, we welcome you um, to do that. Just let Michelle or I know and we will make sure that we put you into our our schedule that morning if you'll be doing a land acknowledgement. Oh, thank you, Michelle. You added. Thank you. And with that, we can move to the next slide. So we really, early on, want you to think about what your why is. Why did you sign up for this training? And if you were like, well, I need it for work. You're working at a community sexual assault program and you need it. Um, your advocate for um, training certificate. What moved you to work, uh, to apply for work at that agency that you're working at? Um, so my why is for my... Um, grandchildren and the um, descendants I'm going to have after that, their grandchildren. I want to change the trajectory, and that's why I joined the Movement to End Violence, which is a greater movement internationally that people are working in all over the world to end gender-based violence. So my why is this little cute guy. Um, he is my second-born grandson. can't believe it. My daughter is a grandmother to two amazing boys, and this is Joaquin, and he's very happy to be in the world. He is going to be two in August, so he's not that little anymore, but he's just as adorable. Um, and think about any apprehensions you may have. Normal. Normal to have apprehensions, right? What about, I'm inviting you all to share in the chat again. I have to tell you, 
saying share in the chat is very challenging for me. I want to switch the SH and the CH. Um, what is your why? What brought you here? And I hope also if you don't if you don't want to share in the chat, you don't have to. Um, you have a journal and you're writing down these things, putting today's date, February 21st, 2022, and writing down why. Why am I here? What am I doing? It's a very, very, it's very rewarding work. It's trauma work. We're dealing with trauma every day. We're in a pandemic. And so um, thank you, Omni. Let me see, I'm going to read out loud what Omni put in there. Curiosity and learning more about best practices in caring for people in the world. And then before that, Michelle said, I'm here because I believe advocacy works. And I care deeply about the advocacy. Thank you for sharing, you too. Oh, and Destiny, my why is because I'm a survivor of sexual assault. And I want to be able to educate and help survivors. I just recently got a job as a prevention education coordinator at Gadget Beauty Staff. Congratulations. On your new position. So a lot of uh, times through this training, we'll be talking about self-care because um, it's really important. This is intense work, and we've got to take care of ourselves. Susan shared, turning point to help my mother get out of an abusive marriage and thus provided myself and my siblings a better environment. I return now to the same organization as their program director. That makes me emotional. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Okay. <sighs> to pay it forward. Continue to provide better futures to children and end the cycle of BDSA. And uh, thank you, Susan. Oh. Levy says, my why, because it is more than just personal, it's about breaking the cycle and breaking silence so that maybe my children's children will never know the feeling. This is great. I think this is a first for me. I'm shedding tears in the beginning of session one. Oh. And it just it just activates me and um, my family and I are from the Yakima Reservation, the Yakima Valley, um, and we led a domestic violence situation and ended up in a DV shelter in Seattle. And I saw fire from Seattle Rape Relief about doing this work, and I thought, maybe this would be good. And I didn't know if I could do it or not, but I went through their really intensive 40-hour training, um, interactive, and found out I could do it. So, and you know what? Some people, and we've had that happen, have had to say, I thought I could. I can't. I'm not ready yet. And stop. So, it's all good. Yeah, this work will always be here, really. Uh, so um, I think Patricia, for sure, and a lot of people that we, you know, work with kind of pop in and do work in the field for a while and pop out. You never really leave, but it's always here for us to, to um, contribute to. Sarah says, my personal life experience, my passion to serve and give back, and my four daughters. The reason we ask you about your why is to so that we it helps us uh, when it's time for us to do um, any kind of coping when we're trying to mitigate things like vicarious trauma. In the last session, we're going to come back to the why and think about the ways in which we want to provide protective kind of structures for ourselves and to stay connected to why we're doing this work. 
Um, that helps guard against things like cynicism and burnout. When we say, okay, this is there's a purpose to this. Uh, what's my reason for being here? To help ground us in the work that we do, um, because those things are real. They're real um, kind of um, workplace. Uh, <laughs> they're like um, uh, I can't I can't think of the the word for it. But they're they're it's not really about if we will get vicarious trauma about when and how and what kind of structures we have uh, to protect us from, from that and help mitigate the impacts um, so that we can continue working. The, the emotional labor um, kind of impacts. Okay. So, um, this is Patricia again. What's an advocate's role and as you can read along with me here, it is to provide information to inform choices, support safety, serve as a liaison between survivor and system, inform the client of their rights, listen, inform of other resources. So we are a wealth of information. We're going to glean all these resources and information and I want you all to know that the coalition, your state sexual assault coalition, your state domestic violence coalition, is also a resource and a wealth of information. So that's what our job is. Contact us and, and uh, if you have questions about um, resources. And we can check with the resource sharing project, with the, which is um, national, all the coalitions throughout the United States and territory. So what an advocate's role is not, we don't make decisions, we don't rescue, investigate, we don't be friends with, become friends, we don't provide therapy, loan money, take them home, give them rides, judge, blame. When you serve as a liaison between the survivor and system, you have to make sure the, the survivor has language access if needed, right? An ASL interpreter, a Spanish language interpreter, an indigenous language interpreter. Um, we have many people who have immigrated to this area along the I-5 corridor and in Yakima County where I'm from. Um, who are from indigenous communities from Central South America and Mexico. And so it can be really challenging. And that's where your network of all these connections is so important. The advocate provide, practices healthy boundaries at all times and doesn't become the survivor's only support system, but helps them identify one. So we are here um, to respect survivors' decisions, even if we don't agree with them, and to provide them more of a big picture and more resources also. It's, you know, you never know what the survivor's needs are going to be, and so it's ever-changing. It's always evolving. And we, as facilitators and working for the coalition, we learn so much from advocates who are doing the face-to-face -face work with survivors. So in this training, it's a community of learners, and Michelle and I are learning also from all of you. So please share if you have any, any ideas that you'd like to share. You can put that in the chat. And I see other people have shared their why. Thank you. Yeah, the thing about this work is that, you know, one of the things we said on the first day on the orientation, you know, is to expect um, and accept non-closure, right? That you're going to leave here and still not know all the things because you can't. It's impossible, right? Every survivor has such a unique experience. Uh, and what they're going to want and need and their intersecting identities and the nature of their assault, they're all going to be so different. 
Uh, and so, as Patricia always likes to say, the driver's in the driver's seat, and we're kind of, you know, riding in the passenger seat with the map, you know, being like, okay, which way do you want to go? You want to take the scenic route? You want to take the most direct route? Like, you know, that we're kind of the nav, we're going to help with the navigation part. Um, but they're the pilot, they're in the driver's seat. So, one of the things that is can be really challenging about this work is because sometimes it feels close to therapy. And so one of the things that is important for us to understand is some of the differences between advocacy and therapy. And there's no one way to heal from uh, sexual assault, from trauma. And so psychotherapy and support groups might be great healing tools for a survivor that we're working with, but they're not a replacement for what uh, we can provide as advocates, right? So a lot of times, uh, you know, we might see somebody be like, okay, you're done with advocacy and then you go to therapy, but it's not really linear in that way, right? Some people don't want to go to therapy at all. Some people need an advocate while they're in therapy. And so it's not a replacement. These are two uh, options. And so let's talk a little bit about uh, kind of what this looks like. So self-determination and autonomy, um, feeling heard and social supports are important uh, factors in healing that advocates can provide. So advocates have a real unique position to engage with survivors from um, lots of different experiences and areas and cultures. Um, so let's see, the advocacy, the advocate role, as Patricia was saying, um, you know, is, is kind of not to make decisions. So our role is to provide crisis intervention, um, which we're going to learn how to do together to provide coping with symptoms. So the symptoms of trauma, the aftermath and impact of sexual violence and abuse. Uh, we work on the coping with symptoms. Um, therapy uh, works to alleviate those symptoms, right? And process trauma. So we're kind of dealing with these more immediate crises pieces. We're dealing with helping with coping with symptoms, but we're not trying to alleviate that. We're not trying to get rid of them. That's a therapist's job to dig deeper into the root to alleviate them. We're saying, how can you be surviving on a day-to-day -day basis when these things come up, right? And sometimes coping, uh, coping mechanisms are, you know, more or less, um, healthy. Um, and so we try to work with where a survivor is at on those symptoms. So we're going to talk about that throughout this training. A big, big part of what we do is to normalize and validate. Yes, many sexual assault survivors feel that way. So many people uh, report what you're telling me right now. Um, that is a normal reaction to uh, just an awful thing that's happened, right? So we're looking at, uh, at normalizing and validating because sexual violence is so isolating that sometimes we feel so alone, we feel so uh, just crazy, we feel like um, just alone and like the only people who are feeling like that. So we help to provide more connection as advocates to fight and mitigate the isolation that um, sexual assault um, uh, that sexual assault does to individual survivors, right? So normalizing and validating is an incredibly important part of what we do. Whereas a therapist is going to do some deeper exploration feelings, right? They might be like, well, what makes you feel that way? Um, you know, go deeper into what, sh what, you know, the shame might be coming from. We also provide information options and resources. Um, and it is 
uh, I'll jump down and say it's also that broad focus on all potential elements of victimization. And that means that we're not just working with emotions, where a therapist is working on behaviors and emotions. Their specific focus is emotional behavioral responses. And we might be working on like trying to help find housing. We might be trying to help, um, you know, walk through the criminal justice process with somebody. We might be helping somebody get a protection order. We might be, you know, connecting to food banks. And so we're looking at kind of all of the big impacts that happen in a sexual assault survivor's life um, post-abuse, right, or post-assault. And those impact all different aspects of our lives. And a therapist is going to have some kind of more specific um, work to do to focus on those emotional and behavioral responses. They might also, therapists might also give specific advice, um, not always, but it's definitely something a therapist might do, whereas that's never something we would do because they're always in the driver's seat uh, and we want to make sure we're on um, just real, um, as, as equitable a uh, relationship as we can with the people that we're supporting. Uh, we provide psychoeducation about sexual assault, so uh, I can, you know, as, as an advocate, I can talk with a survivor about uh, the impacts of trauma, uh, the neurobiology of trauma, um, what's common for sexual assault. I can talk about things like um, triggers and dissociation, the things that are really connected to that, and provide some psychoeducation. This can be super helpful for survivors as we start to fight against that isolation of feeling like I'm alone and I'm crazy, right? That, oh, tonic immobility is such a common response. That's the freeze response during a sexual assault. And I always thought I would fight or that I would run away or I would fight harder. And so some of the psychoeducation about what actually happens scientifically in your body or in relationship to trauma helps to normalize and validate and fight against the isolation that sexual assault um, causes, right? So providing psychoeducation is a big thing, a big part of our, our work that we do and a big part of things that we do in support group, right? Uh, the other thing that we can do is identify and respond to cognitive distortions, right? So survivors that are blaming themselves, um, they are cognitive distortions are things like, um, it's my fault, I was assaulted, I shouldn't have been there, I'm a bad person, I put myself in this situation, right? Those are cognitive distortions. And so again, we wanna go back to providing psychoeducation to respond to the cognitive distortions to say like, actually, you know, most people freeze and just any ways that we can help survivors kind of find their path back from shame and blame to, you know, healing and a real understanding about what trauma does to our bodies so that we can remove that blame, remove that shame uh, from the individual survivors and put it back on the perpetrator where it belongs, right? So, Cognitive distortions are just the tendency, the patterns of thinking that are that are false, that are inaccurate. Um, you know, so sometimes that means that we do a lot of it's not your fault. This wasn't your fault. I understand that that you're saying it feels that way, and I can provide information that can normalize and validate in the psychoeducation piece to help you kind of you know respond to those cognitive distortions. And a therapist is going to help try to resolve that, you know, um, they're going to really try to resolve that. We're just responding to, we're not trying to unpack everything, um, but just to say, you know, I know that that's not true. And here's why I know that that's not true by using pieces of psychoeducation information and normalizing and validating. Any questions so far on this? I don't see anything on the chat, Michelle. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of information. So remember, the sessions are recorded 
this always helps me. I need to go down and redo, you know, go back and redo. So. So what does this look like when we're working with children? Sometimes that feels really different um, and there's a lot of apprehension and fear around working with children. Um, my colleague Soleil and I just finished uh, an, um, a child sexual abuse uh, webinar for beginners that talks a lot about this that is gonna replace the section in the e-learning course. So if anybody wants to see that, that's actually ready now. Um, so it's not in the e-learning course yet, but if you do want to want to view that, there's a lot of information there that can provide you. But it really doesn't look super different, right? So we're providing information to inform choices. We're trying to find uh, ways in which um, children who are experiencing a loss of choice in a world where they don't have a ton of choices to figure out what kind of, how can I provide more choice for the child that I'm working with? So always introducing myself to the child and not just the parent, right? And making sure that a child wants to talk with me. Um, and if a child is open and comfortable to continue to the, um, talking to me, then I'm making sure they understand what it is that I do. Um, so working with teens and children's also, uh, children's teens and children also mean practicing healthy boundaries as you would with an adult survivor, right? They're not our children. Um, and so we would talk to them in a different way. Children are very smart and they'll come back for support if they feel they trust you. Also, kids are always hungry. So we want to make sure we have snacks, we have juice, we have water, things like that. So our role is really similar to as to adults. So we're, we often serve as a liaison between survivors and systems. Sometimes we liaise between parent and child. Um, it's always great when a parent can have their own advocate as well, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. We wanna let them know what their rights are, um, listen. Um, sometimes what um, I've done historically is like, just to have different activities in the room and start, you know, playing with them myself, coloring, sitting on the floor and, and coloring. And then as we're coloring, we're having a conversation and we're letting that conversation kind of go where it needs to go. And, and a lot of times it doesn't need to go around talking about abuse and trauma, but about safety or, um, um, you know, what, what rights children have, like you have the right to say no and your body is yours and lots of different things like that that we can be able to do and, and talk about where we're doing some of that normalizing, validating and providing psychoeducation, but in a child-friendly way, right? Um, so we're just listening for what their concerns are, if they have any. Um, younger children too are just so resilient and so it's just gonna look a lot different um, as children get older, their understanding of what's happened and their resiliency kind of starts to shift, especially as teens become really um, focused on peer groups and things like that. Okay, some additional. Okay, so how do we let them know that they're the client? One of the things that I've always done is to give them my business card. Um, direct questions and statements to them if I'm working with them with their parent, right? That I'm making sure that if they're in the room that they're involved um, as, as ever appropriate. So we also wanna be really honest about mandatory reporting responsibilities in, in the next session on ethics and confidentiality, we're gonna talk about mandatory reporting. Um, we never assume how old somebody is. Um, if we're working with a family but the child is the victim, it's really important for us to try to have a separate advocate for those parents 
Um, it's difficult for a child to build trust with an advocate who is also working with their parents in some circumstances, but it's also really important for the parent to um, be able to have somebody that they can talk to to air their frustrations that isn't happening in front of their child. Because there could be real conflicts when we're working with child sexual abuse survivors, right? It can be mom's boyfriend may be sexually abused her child, right? And boyfriend is not dad, right? But it's been a really long relationship. She is really confused about how she couldn't have seen this coming. She's having a hard time believing it, right? And so it's really important that somebody like an advocate or a therapist is there to be able to hear those things so that she's not and, and process them and, and help normalize and validate those things while also talking about like what grooming looks like and different aspects of child sexual abuse. Um, so they're able to process that because if they can't, then that kind of thing, you know, becomes part of a conversation that a parent and a child are having together that can really damage the child's ability to heal and kind of move forward and feel protected. So always having that opportunity for a parent to talk about those things that are hard and to talk about, you know, especially if they're having a hard time believing that it happened. That's really important. We don't want them to be talking about that kind of stuff in front of the child. Um, uh, we don't want any doubts to happen, but we also know that that's a natural part of that, um, of the process for the people who are very close to survivors. And not just parents, but um, partners, girlfriends, boyfriends, um, husbands, spouses, um, sisters, you know, all of the family units and people really close to survivors are very impacted. Kind of like if you throw a stone in the water, there's the ripples that go out and that's around the whole community around the survivor that those ripples kind of filter out through. Okay, just do a quick stretch. So at your, um, at your computer, if you can stand up or put your feet on the floor, kind of stretch your arms up. Make sure you feel comfortable in your chair you Can roll your head around a little bit. Just get some good stretching here. Feel, feel in your body, whatever you need to do to do that. It's the morning, so maybe we haven't even stretched yet at all. Okay. So for the rest of our morning here, we're gonna really focus on the core principles of trauma-informed care. And I think Patricia is gonna get us started with that. Thank you, Michelle. So there are six, as you can see here, and we're gonna go through them, Michelle and I, one by one. Core principles of trauma-informed care. Safety, ensuring physical and emotional safety. Trust, maximizing trustworthiness. Making paths clear. Maintaining appropriate boundaries. Choice, prioritizing survivor choice and decision-making. Supporting survivors' control over their own healing journey their autonomy, their agency. Collaboration, maximizing collaboration and sharing power with survivors. Empowerment, identifying strengths, prioritizing building skills that promote survivor healing and growth. Cultural relevance, ensuring cultural applicability of services and options sensitivity to the role of culture in lived experience and decision-making. And we saw 
that in the cultural relevancy, just in the check-ins on why our why is um, people felt comfortable enough to share their own life experiences. And um, you could see the varying cultures in those responses being represented. And also, thinking about that, I want to um, remind us all that what is shared here stays here. The, the knowledge and the, and the learning, of course, we're going to use it. We're going to share it with others. But when people feel comfortable to disclose something, that's their personal information, and it stays with them. And we heard it, and we make note of it, and we keep it to ourselves. Um, so I will begin with fostering safety. Grounding and centering ourselves. And in orientation, we talked about grounding and how we ground ourselves. And we can make sure we know where our feet are. And when we have the opportunity, do some earthing, um, bare feet on grass or, or dirt or um, the beach sand. So that helps us. Um, putting our fingers together like this is very grounding also. And there were so many other suggestions that were amazing. Our breathing is the first thing to grounding and centering ourselves by paying attention to our breath and slowing our pace down when we're speaking and really being mindful. The second bullet, bullet point being consistent, predictable, nonviolent, non shaming, offering strength, non blaming, affirming wholeness, and being respectful. So um, what does this look like in practice? What does this look like with young people also at different developmental stages, right? There's just so much variety. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we don't know how a survivor is going to present. And we really don't know. We plan and train and learn and everything. We really don't know how we're going to. We're going to present differently in every situation as an advocate, depending on that situation. But what we've got in our tool belt are our tools, our go-tos. Um, the universe may put another great idea into our mind, and we'll be like, oh, whoa, that's amazing. Yes, I'm going to use that. And when that happens, please send us an email and share that with us. We're always wanting new tools for our tool belt. And as we go through this, I mean, Patrice and I will share, you know, what has worked really well for us and different things that we've tried. Um, we have lots of handouts that we're going to, um, that we have available to you in the Dropbox um, and activities that we're going to practice on finding different, different ways to talk about things, different ways for us to offer strengths and affirm wholeness. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about fostering trust. One of the things about this chart, you know, it's like, it's arranged as a square in a linear way. And I really feel like I keep wanting to change it so that it's like these circles more that overlap um, kind of all the way around because they, they all work together. They're not really separate things. So when we're fostering trust, we're also fostering safety, right? So we're validating um, the experiences that survivors are having. We're validating their coping skills that they have um, while offering additional ones. Trauma-informed care recognizes the long-term and pervasive impact of violence. So fostering trust is really important to that, right? Big trust has been violated. So we want to be trustworthy and trusting people uh, when we're working with folks and also to help them foster trust in other ways, right? How they can work on their own trust. So it's important for us to have clear boundaries, for us to have real defined roles that we, that we tell people when we start working with them, here's what it is that we do. Here's what you can expect from me and that I do my best to make sure I live up to those expectations and don't create expectations that I can't um, live up to, right? I can't make promises about how your court case is going to go, or if the police are going to take your report, or if, um, 
or if you can get an abortion uh, at however many weeks that you're at, right? I can't promise any of those things, um, but I can be predictable in, in ways and I can help you figure out what those resources are. Let's find out. I don't know if the police will take your report, but I can go with you. But here's what I've seen before. Here's been my experience. Let's try these things. Um, does this sound helpful to you, right? That we're working on trust by not making promises that we can't keep or going anywhere outside our role, our defined role and our boundaries. And that we're sharing information and we're transparent, right? I'm not the keeper of information. I'm not the keeper of things. Um, that what I have to offer is often available in a Google search, right? That I want to share this information and not kind of hold it back. So whatever people want to know, um, however transparent I can be about um, information that I have is super useful. So we want to also be able to um, uh, be aware of the power and balance um, like I said before, we want to create as equitable a uh, relationship as we can. However, we are the ones that maybe have the bus passes or the ones that have an office and a business card or seem professional in some way. And so we have to be aware of that perceived power imbalance, right? Um, that um, we want to make sure that we're really clear, all choices are yours. Uh, and that we're not coming at it with, if we make a suggestion or we offer some different options, then a lot of times people might say, oh, it, that sounds like what I should do, um, or that it's not like, oh, you're telling me I should do this, <laughs> that makes sense. So we just want to be really aware of any perceived power imbalance um, or real power imbalances, because sometimes we do have access to the rental assistance. Uh, we do have access to the snacks or the food that's needed for the kids, you know? So we want to just be really aware and, and, um, and respectful of that power imbalance and try to, try to make it as equitable as we can. And that will help to um, foster trust. Other things too is, you know, in our next session, we're going to talk more about ethics and what those mean but um, that we are maintaining those boundaries, that we explain what those boundaries are, confidentiality, what their rights are as a client and as a victim of crime, and you know, grievance policies if they want them, how they can look at their file if they want to, right? That we're trying to um, just give as much information um, and control over their, their own situation as possible. So it's both safety, are you guys switching? Okay. Um, both safety and trust develop with our first words when we're first meeting. Um, we don't want to train ourselves or um, our staff or volunteers to filling out a form. Um, we want to be geared toward the individual that sits in front of us uh, or on the other end of the phone line, right? I like a form. I know this about myself. So I have to put the form away until later um, to make sure that I am paying attention, that I'm engaging in a two-way conversation. Then I'm just telling a survivor, here's what, here's what we do here. Because um, sometimes people will come in and they'll want to meet with somebody, but they're not, they haven't directly said that they've experienced sexual assault, right? So we say, here's what we do here at our program. We provide services to these types of victims of crime. Um, some, some of your programs will do, you know, child advocacy centers or crime victim services or domestic violence services also. We just talk about all the different things that we do and can provide. Um, we want the survivor to understand what our program does. We want them to get to know uh, what advocates are. And we want to get to know them and what their goals are. What's brought you here today, right? And then sometimes we need to fill out a form because we have to collect information. But I always try to wait till the end and then kind of go back and not repeat, not ask things that they've said. Um, if they already told me, what their you know, preferred pronouns were. I don't need to ask them what it is on the form that I'm kind of moving around the pieces that I don't have 
and putting that, you know, into the form and filling it out um, later. And that takes some exercise, some brain exercises, you know, oh, you said this earlier and I forgot, but I want to make sure that I'm capturing it now. We want to make sure first, though, that we have a conversation with people, that we connect as humans without forms until afterwards. So, um, one of the things that is really important and actually very cool about advocacy is that we don't have to figure out what happened. And um, that is my favorite thing about this work. And we're often the only person in a survivor's life who's not trying to figure out what happened. You know, their sister or their best friend is like, I don't understand how this could happen because they're trying to cope with what happened as well. They're trying to cope with their own vicarious trauma to what happened to their friend or their sister. The nurse is trying to find out what happened. So is the police. So is, you know, anybody else that's working with them. Let us be the only people who aren't trying to do that. When I go into the emergency room to meet with a survivor after a sexual assault, I I'm not going to ask them to tell me anything about what brought them there. My role is to say, here's what I do. I know why they're there. That's why that somebody called me there, right? I don't have to know the details because the nurse is going to ask that. And I don't, I just need to know what it is the survivor wants to be able to, you know, respond to that. I don't have to know all the details of what's happened. And, um, the questions that I want to ask if I'm coming into an emergency room are things like, would you like me to stay for this part of the exam? Would you like for me to refer you, um, you know, did the nurse explain to you this? Do you have any questions for me to follow up with in a few days? Those types of things, right? I don't ask about the experience, just about how I can support them. And that's my main goal. If they wanna tell me a ton about what happened, that's okay too, they get to do that. But it's not important for me to ask them in order for me to do my job, right? Go ahead, Patricia. Fostering choice. Personal experience of choice builds the ability to direct life and dream. Giving choices fosters safe relationships, conscious, intentional, and verbalized. That's what choice giving choices looks like. The conscious and conscious, intentional, and verbalized. Involves involves survivors in program evaluation and design. Involve survivors in program evaluation and design. Ask for their suggestions. So I'm going to read from my notes. Awareness of power dynamics and how therapeutic relationships can inadvertently mimic abusive relationships. Michelle mentioned that. And again, these, these connect so much and they overlap. Control over names. Are you a client or a consumer, a survivor, or do you prefer the word, you know, which word do you prefer? And there are many choices, survivor, victim. Nothing about us without us, right? This is their experience. And in this moment in time, they're with us. So that's what we're focusing on as the advocate. Recognize difficulties in involving survivors and the position of survivor advocate. Survivor slash advocate. The power dynamics, again, that Michelle mentioned. You go to the next slide, Michelle. This is a great quote from Haynes, 1999. The ability to choose based on your own internal experience, what you want physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and sexually, and then to communicate those wants. 
consent is an ongoing process of making choices. Ask permission for everything we do and offer. It be as simple as, are you thirsty? Would you like a cup of tea, water, coffee? Confidentiality and dual relationships are the focus, a dual relationship. This quote that, uh, from Hain supports building a culture of trauma-informed care from the very start and throughout all of our interactions with the survivors. It is crucial to, in, to the entire process of orientation. As Michelle mentioned also, we're the only person that's going to be interacting with them in this way, the advocate, the medical staff, the legal people, the, if they want um, police involved, although everybody's going to want something from them, right? Need information. And we don't, unless, as Michelle said, they want to, ch want to share that with us, then we actively listen. And... Uh, Thank them for sharing, but we don't ask, we don't dig, we don't ask, you know, more questions just because our own we're human, our own curiosity is peaking at that moment. We put that aside. It's really this whole process is about being in the moment and being mindful and really being aware of where that person presenting in front of you is at and um, supporting them in that moment. We can go to the next slide, Michelle. Okay, Cass had a question here. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. About mimicking an abusive relationship. Um, so anytime that we're not offering a lot of choices or in, an, in a hierarchical kind of um, situation where I have power, um, like I said about the bus pass, right? Like if somebody has to come to me and ask me for a bus pass, that's already like put me in a place where I have things that they need. And so what are the things that we can do and how can we practice that so we're not withholding if somebody asks me for a bus pass, I will always give them a bus pass if I have them, whether they had them yesterday or whether, you know, somebody might later on need one and this is my last one. It doesn't matter, right? When I become in, in that place to really like uh, be withholding things that are needed or um, using my power to leverage any of those resources, then, then it can mimic some of those abusive relationships, um, not in as extreme a way, but in a way that can be really activating for those survivors, right? So figuring out how can I, how can I create a relationship um, as a service provider that's fostering as much safety, as much trust, and as much choice, and also using transparency. I really want to give you this fast pass. I promise this to somebody else and this is the last one, but here's the plan about me getting more bus passes, right? How can we just kind of like make it um, so that we're, we're really not trying to be the guardian of information or resources or, you know, if you're nice to me, then you can get the things that you need, right? We don't wanna, we don't wanna kind of uh, be putting ourselves in any situation like that, right? Something you wanna add, Patricia? Yeah, that, you know, think about manipulation and think about gaslighting. All these things are very real. And let's say we have, um, I'm with somebody, I'm an advocate and a survivor present, and I bring them a cup of coffee full of sugar and cream and, you know, very, very presumptuous of me, right? Well, this is how I like my coffee, which I don't. But, you know, so I'm going to just assume that they're going to just love this. So that's one thing. That's being presumptuous. But 
but another, just giving choices. If we were in um, a room all together, we would be giving you all choices about what color of paper you, you know, we've got this paper, what color do you want? We would be showing, modeling that for you. But it's really of thinking things um, in a different way and in your new role as advocate. So the last slide on choice. These are considerations for your agencies and individual advocacy roles. How much choice does the survivor have over what services they right? What services does your agency um, provide? Where and how they meet with an advocate? What are your protocols during this pandemic? Um, how do we build in choices, big and small, for survivors in our service delivery? And for us, you know, the choices may be like minuscule, but for someone who's had their power taken from them, it's a big deal. It's something mm -hmm. they might not even be able to put their finger on, but you are helping them feel whole again. Go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, it's, I always think about it like exercise, right? Like building muscles. We're building choice muscles um, because big, big choices were taken away either through a series of um, abuses as, you know, a child or um, a big choice is taken away on, you know, uh, from a coworker or while incarcerated or by somebody who was trusted, right? And so the ways that we start to work back that violation of trust is by exercising more choice. Um, and so how can we build those in both big and small? There's a couple of different ways that we can do things like that. Where would you like to sit, right? That's such an easy one, right? If I just sit here and tell them to sit there, you know, like I'm sitting on one side of the desk and they're sitting on the other side. Sometimes there's only two seats, but ask them which one they would like. If you have a bigger room with more seats, they like to sit here, or they like to stand, or they like to sit on the floor. What are those options? Um, figuring out how many options I have to provide and to be able to provide that, right? Um, one thing that I used to do when I worked in a domestic violence shelter for a long time is um, when a new person would come into the shelter, we would take them out into the garage, which is where we had our um, food pantry. And I would just say, can you find anything you want here to bring into the kitchen, you know, just so that you, they knew, like, I have food here. Because sometimes you're in there and you're like, I don't know whose food this is. And so it just helps, like, kind of orient somebody and get them comfortable. And I remember there was one woman that I had taken in there and she, I said, you know, I said, here's all the different cereals. Like, what cereal do you like? Um, you know, take, take it. And she said, I don't know. And I was like, oh, what do you mean? And she said, I wasn't allowed to choose, you know, like I, I went to the store with a shopping list that was made by, you know, by her abuser, right? And that's what she thought. And she's like, I don't even know what I like anymore. And I was like, okay, no problem. See, we have like six different cereals in here. Why don't you like pick one? And then like, if you don't like it and you like something different, we can come back out here, right? How are we helping to exercise some of those choice muscles? Some people's choice muscles are really, have not been, you know, bulked up. And so sometimes those little things is just how we start to build that, right? You don't get off your couch and run a 5K. You walk around a little bit, then you gotta jog a little bit, right? So I always think about choice in that way. Um, and how how much I can offer that, and what are the different ways that they can practice that on their own as well. Fostering collaboration. Um, what time is it now? Ten thirty. I think we're going to end pretty early today. Let's take let's actually let's take a break now uh, for ten minutes. And then we'll come back and then we'll finish up. And for sure, we're going to end early today. We always end early on the first session. We have less kind of interactive stuff. So let's come back at 10.42, okay? Great.
Okay, fostering collaboration. So when we foster collaboration, we're, we're kind of adapting a partnership approach to services. Uh, one of the ways that uh, one of my colleagues in Iowa likes to talk about this is she says, advocates are a roadmap rather than a GPS. And if we're thinking about how Patricia talks about like if survivors are in the driver's seat, this is a really helpful kind of analogy, right? That we are, a GPS will tell you to turn left here. It tells you the route, right? If you look at the map, you can choose all the different ways in which you want to get there. And that's how, how we want to operate. We don't want to tell somebody step by step how to do something, but rather to say, here's lots of different ways how to get to where you're going um, on your kind of healing journey, right? So we want to make sure we're operating like a roadmap instead of a GPS. We want to make sure that, that the goals are mutually established, that they are setting their own goals, saying, here's what I want to happen next. Here's what I want to happen now. Um, and one of the things that can be really important in the healing and fostering collaboration is that opportunity to be with other survivors to offer that mutual support. So many of us come to this work as we've seen in establishing our why because we are survivors and the ways in which we have worked on our healing is through um, using our experience to kind of transform what's happened to us into something more useful i have something to offer because i have this experience that was terrible but I've gotten through it. And, you know, then I have something to offer that uh, to people who are going through that as well. And these opportunities for us to be in support group or in communities with other survivors to offer that mutual support, very important to, to a healing process. It can be for some survivors. Everybody's different, of course. Um, how are we helping to increase knowledge, self-worth, and ability for action. Um, one of the things that I always like to talk about is, is, again, the ways in which we foster choice and trust um, overlap with this collaboration. We're walking next to somebody. We are not repositories of information. Everything that I know is available someplace else too. Uh, and so I like to find opportunities to show where I get information, if that's something that's interesting to the folks that I'm working with. My colleague, Britt, who I worked with at lo a local program years ago, was always um, saying, well, let's Google that. Um, and so she had this one particular caller who would call her pretty often. Um, and would refer to her as Google. And I think this example, you know, she would call her and be like, ask questions, and then they would Google, Google it together. And I like this example because Britt is saying, here's where I'm getting this information. Uh, so it's saying, you know, I'm here, I'm here to help you. I can do it with you. Uh, I'm not doing anything for you because I'm saying, here's how I'm getting this information. And we're equipping people with like, here's, here's where the information is at, um, right? I also like to call people on speakerphone with survivors where we're calling together, not um, that I'm making phone calls for them and will report back what I know or what I heard or what they told me, right? How am I involving them to the greatest extent in the work that I'm doing with them, right? Or on their behalf or utilizing and leveraging my relationship to connect them with the person that they need to talk to because I know the person at the prosecutor's office, or I know this particular detective, right? I'm using that um, to give them a new source of knowledge and a new source of strength, right? I have information. I have some expertise in this particular field, but it's not useful without the survivor's ideas, their goals, and their self-assessment of what their needs are, their desires, their dreams, right? I only have so much information. And so this is how we begin to foster things like collaboration. <clears throat> Fostering empowerment.
partnership approaches to services, building on strength, creating opportunities for survivors to do and give back. The wisdom of both survivor and advocates is appreciated. Identify strength, creating creates more strength. Identifying strengths creates more strength. Validating resiliency. Celebrating the whole person. Building on strength includes validating choices. Celebrating the whole person is social roles, strengths that have nothing to do with what they experience and why they are there with you. Giving opportunities to, um, to other survivors um, as a mentor, to, a, a, to the agency in an advisory capacity. Their, our lived experiences, and we're talking about the survivors that present for services, their lived experience can really um, give us valuable ways and how we can do the work better. And um, that's really powerful on so many levels because they can bring things up and do that we've never thought of before. Just as I mentioned in this um, advocacy core certification, the initial certification to become a sexual assault advocate, you all will come up with things that we had would never in a hundred years have thought of, but here you come with, you know, oh, what about this? It's so helpful. So um, continuing to take this opportunity to encourage you to share your wisdom with us and in chat or in email. Michelle, do you want to add anything to the fostering empowerment? Again, these are all circles that are just overlapping, right? Empowerment is connected to choice. It's connected to collaboration. Um, uh, we can't provide empowerment. We can only foster it, right? People, you know, we can't give power to somebody else, but help them locate their own power, right? Like Patricia said, building on strength. If you recognize one strength, that creates more opportunities for strength. And sometimes it's really hard to find one. How can we locate one that says, I got thank, here today? Thank you, Michelle. That just takes me back to the land acknowledgement and about a video that I watched because um, a coworker shared it with me. Um, the power piece. We cannot give the land back to the Nisqually. We cannot give the land back to the Puyallup. But we can acknowledge that we are on unceded territory and that there have been people here since time immemorial and they are still here and they are leaders in the community. And so it's an action we can take in a way that will not continue to contribute to disempowerment. And I think the next slide is yours, Michelle. You bet. That's a great analogy, Patricia. Thank you. And then the last piece uh, or the last overlapping of uh, is about cultural relevance and humility. Um, I don't say cultural competency. Uh, that used to be a big term because you can't possibly be competent in all cultures. There are as many cultures uh, right here in this group as there are people. Right. Uh, there's cultures, there's subcultures, there's the intersections of our identities and where they live. And if we're not approaching advocacy from an intersectional place, we're not doing our best advocacy. Right. Patricia said we are celebrating whole people. Right. That the people that we work with are not just what's happened to them, but they're culture and their social standings and their relationships and their achievements, right? That we are looking at people as whole individuals. And this includes their culture and the experiences of what violence and trauma might mean across cultures. When I was doing 
um, work with the Sexual Assault Coalition in American Samoa. One of the things that um, that uh, we talked a lot about was really about how we were going to language and kind of talk about what it was that they did, because the director was like, we don't have a word in Samoan for trauma. Um, and while everybody is bilingual, speaks both Samoan and English, Samoan is the one that's going to be more connected because it's the language of their grandparents, the language of their house, that that's the one that's connected to emotion and some of those deep experiences. And so thinking about how they were going to explain trauma in Samoan became really challenging. And so what they did was they, they, there was a tsunami that happened on the island and it was, it had traumatized the whole island, impacted everybody. And they started to use that and work with that as a way to talk about violence in families and sexual violence um, and the impact on individual people because there was no word for trauma. Uh, that they use that as a concept to explain it uh, in Samoan. And then that kind of led them to how that they were, that they wanted to do their work with survivors, which was really um, around the impact on the community and healing as a community and how important that was in their particular culture, right? So um, a lot of things can't be just translated. Right. Uh, we see this also in Spanish, right? You can't translate advocate directly. If you use Google Translate, you'll get the, the uh, translation that means lawyer uh, oftentimes or someone who who's the defender. Uh, and those aren't really actually accurate. Right. So sometimes you have to use more words to explain what it is that you're working with. Also, people whose English is their first language, don't know what an advocate is either, right? We have to use uh, and explain concepts and discuss these different things. So the meaning of what violence and trauma really varies across cultures and how we start to talk about it. We also want to, um, trauma-informed care means that we're taking into consideration the social and political factors, right? So, for example, for, for several years now, there's been a great deal of anti-immigrant sentiment, right? We saw babies in cages at the border, right? We saw deportations happening and, and ICE raids and things like that happening. We saw a president who was using words and actions to portray uh, that it, it, certain um, immigrants are not welcome here, right? And as immigrant communities, that gets taken in and personalized, right? And trust erodes within those communities between um, what might appear to be a mainstream uh, organization. So expecting that immigrant communities during these social and political factors are going to come over to your office is not realistic, right? So how are we thinking about what outreach looks like when trust has eroded within some of those communities because deportations are maybe really high in that particular community at that time, that ICE is showing up at protection order hearings and things like that. We have to be really aware of all of the ways that the social and political structures and kind of sentiments are impacting people, right? That there are survivors who are on their way to their appointment that stop uh, to get gas and um, they're on the, their cell phone and they're talking to their uh, family member and they're talking in Spanish and somebody yells at them, you know, oh, I'll speak English here, right? And then by the time they get to their appointment, this is what they want to talk about. This is central to their trauma or has triggered them or activated them in some way. And what your plan was to talk about has now changed because this is the thing that has activated them. And it is connected to that, <clears throat> um, to those traumas, right? We are all experiencing trauma um, based on sometimes these microaggression pieces that happen from day to day, 
outward racial aggression, homophobia, transphobia, all of those kind of things. And we have to be really aware that that could be somebody's um, experience and that, that sometimes that takes precedence uh, when you're meeting with somebody on any particular day. We also want to be open to learning and asking questions because cultural is, all, is also about where our strengths are and how we um, um, feel strong uh, and heal. Um, as a queer person, uh, one of the things that um, really helps me feel strong is to think about strong queer people who came before me and who did, and who, you know, fought for uh, the rights of my, um, of my people, right? Who created those uh, and that I am, I am now the future of those folks. And what am I going to do to build strength in my community moving forward to build upon that legacy, right? And so sometimes those are real places of healing for us when we feel really broken or we feel really traumatized, that we can access some of those strengths and doing that as part of our work to heal. Patricia, do you have things you want to add to that? Thank you for your patience. I was having a hard time unmuting. I just want us to remember that this is an ongoing process and that we are evolving all the time. I mean, from the 90s, you know, for us older people, elders, 90s to Y2K, on and on and on. We are constantly, <laughs> excuse me, evolving and I'm that makes me really excited so I just want to mention before what I mentioned we can't give land back I as an individual cannot give land back right our government can and that's you know and we stand shoulder to shoulder saying we want that to happen so I just wanted to elaborate a little bit more on that me as an individual I don't have the agency to do that but what do I have the agency to do, which is very culturally relevant to a group of people who have been caring for the sacred territory that we're on since time immemorial. So this is just such a really important point, you know, all important, right? But we're so diverse. We are so diverse, and so there's such a richness in that, and we're constantly learning. Thanks, Michelle. Right. And, and not any of us really represent any particular culture, right? Just like I said, there's as many cultures uh, in this learning community right now as there are people, right? Um, and so we want to be open to learning and asking questions like, what about your culture makes you feel strong? What about your culture has made it really hard to, to cope or, or, or inform what sexual violence is and what's okay, you know? The heart of advocacy is recognizing survivors as whole people. And sexual violence is a tool of oppression. So the experience of sexual violence for each survivor can't really be separated from how, you know, racism and adultism or homophobia, sexism, uh, you know, forms of oppression impact our lives. And so race, racism, ableism, other forms of oppression really shape the societal ideals we have about our sexuality, about our body autonomy, um, whether or not, you know, you have to go and um, kiss everybody in the room, uh, you know, to welcome them or to greet them, uh, even if you don't want to, because that's the culture, right? So that teaches us about body autonomy. Uh, it also teaches our culture influences um, you know, and other forms of oppression influence how we are in relationships, uh, influences aspects of our spirituality and all kinds of aspects of our lives. So as we're coming in to do this work together, this is why we do this on the first day as we think about survivors are whole people and trauma, you know, impacts all these different pieces of our, uh, of our work. And so we want to really come at it from this framework of, choice, empowerment, collaboration, safety, trust, and this real cultural humility, a cultural relevance, uh, an understanding of how oppression interacts 
with um, the lives of survivors and all of our lives in the, the water that we swim in, right? Uh, if we are fish, uh, it is the water that we're swimming in, right? <clears throat> so Patricia, why don't you help us kind of take in this last part? Yeah. So we're at the end of the PowerPoint presentation, but um, as Michelle mentioned before, we're here, so we will hang out, you know, once the presentation is done. But what what we would like for you to think about are what do you think will be difficult for you moving forward in this work? And what are you looking forward to learning? So these are really good things to journal about, but if you want to also write, write them in the chat, share them with us, please do. Or you can unmute, yeah, if you'd like to share. The PowerPoint is over, and we could even go to gallery view, and whoever wants to share their video can. You don't have to. If you're not, what is it? Areli says, camera ready, don't worry about it. Uh, we can relate. But if you'd like to share in the chat, what do you think will be difficult about this work for you? What are you looking forward to learning? And if you'd like to unmute yourself 